Hello and welcome to Dragons, Unicorns, and Other Creative Creatures. I'm Dr. Kevin. And I'm Rona Gostein. Thanks for coming and joining us. And we are the host and hostess with the most and toastess of your spiritual... Oh, I'm sorry. No, not spiritual, it. creative. But isn't spiritual but, creative? Well, we've discussed that, that they live very close together. Yeah, they hang out. A they, lot. Yeah, yeah. I think they're pretty inseparable, actually. In many ways. I think that there's always a touch of spirit and creativity, and there's always a touch of creativity and spirit. I always remember this one so. line out of a book that I loved, and it was by, um, I'm trying to remember, she normally writes in science fiction, and I'm blanking on the author's name, I'm hoping it's going to come to me, but she goes, in every good showman is a little shaman, and in every good shaman is a little showman. I like that. And I could see it, too. And I can, you know, and I've kind of looked at that as uh, I go back and forth. Uh, Mercedes Lackey. There you go. It was Mercedes Lackey, She's but it was awesome. in a little, small, tiny series she did about, uh, that was a uh, three, three, uh, three trilogy book about a uh, witch. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and she usually does more of the science fiction fantasy. She does fantasy. more, yeah. She does a little bit of both. This was an alternative reality. Very cool. And it was very good, and I love those books. I haven't read them in years. In fact, now I want to go back and read them again. Of course. Of course. So I want to ask you a question. Do I want to answer it? Go ahead, ask away. So, what do you think about the body as a canvas? I think it's amazing, actually. I mean, I've certainly seen things from the permanent, like tattooing, mm -hmm. which is um, kind of, I've, I've seen examples that are incredible, um, to some of the temporary, I mean, they've done even some reality shows where it's just the temporary body painting, or you, you stand in a certain way and it's one thing and you move your hands and something else yeah I mean, optical illusion art but you know you and i have talked also about the the body as a canvas too i mean i love wearing makeup i have you know my potions and lotions and brushes and blenders and stuff like that so that too is a way of you know using my body as a canvas i've never done anything permanent i do not have any tattoos um but um i think it's I like the idea because it's it's something that's there all the time. You bring it with you. You can you, know, you can be you can be wearable art. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's so interesting because you know all I can think of was in the morning when I wake up before I put on my makeup. I say a little prayer for you. Great. Anyways, thank you, Dion. <sighs> <You're> um, <laughs> but it, so I, I have. I continue to say, and I don't, I don't see this changing mm -hmm. anytime in the near future. I would never get a, um, a tattoo, mm -hmm. a permanent tattoo, because I would never want the pain of taking it off, and I am too changeable. Yeah, I don't think I could I think settle. I can't even settle on like one. I, I like the fact that I can change my nail color every few weeks. So you know, the idea of temporary tattoos. Mm -hmm. Those are fun. Those are fun, because uh, you can change them out it's like you can change your hairstyle you can change yes. your hair color you can do these different things yep um and then of course there's the body there's you know there's some fabulous body for art things that you see where they are doing social cause changes and they yeah. do things where you know it, the the body is there and i think that that the body as a canvas you know again i will never do permanent because i'm too uh, my my Creativity yeah, keeps it's me too just impermanent. Be... Of I don't want to, you know. Yes. Um, but I think that it's very interesting, and I think that it it offers a whole opportunity. The other thing about permanent tattoos is I grew up with uncles that got tattoos in World War II um. that looked great when they were twenty, probably. <laughs> but at fifty, so, sixty, yeah, seventy, it's the sagging sink and was stretching. Kind of yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's very of, few places you can put it where the skin is not going to change. 
I mean, dramatically over time. Would the would would the Mona Lisa still stay the the beautiful piece of art no. if it started no. to sag and gained fifty pounds? <laughs> the canvas got stretched out and wrinkled a little. Oh, yeah, not so much. Not so much. No, you have to be very careful about that kind of thing, depending on what you choose and. Yeah. But I think that uh, I think the body as a canvas is a beautiful thing. Absolutely, it's a it's a wonderful alternative. It's a great statement. Mm -hmm. Speaking of statements and bodies, would you like to introduce today's guest? I would love to. Our guest today is Maria O'Connor, who has a diverse educational and artistic background. You guys are going to love this. You ready? She has a B.S. in wildlife biology and has extensive knowledge of herbs in regards to their medicinal, cosmetic, and aromatherapeutic uses. With a keen interest in body modification and adornment, she began learning about henna and its traditional significance to the various cultures in which it appears. So nowadays, you know, almost anybody can do it for any reason, but that's not how it started. No. Uh, through trial and error, she began doing henna on friends and then doing small local events, holistic fairs, and parties. So 17 years later, Maria and her body art business are still going strong, providing beautiful henna art all over our New England area and beyond. Maria is a published author, yay, and issues of Fuse magazine about henna and its applications in belly dance. I like belly dance. Her latest achievements include teaching her, I think it's pronounced Harquus 101 makeup class at Neat's Belly Dance Camp and also at the 2016 and 17 Henna Gathering. So Maria is our guest today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So you... Um, you began henna as just an extension of you. Pretty much, yes. I started uh, getting involved with henna and adornment uh, back in the mid-90s. Um, I became Wiccan at that point, and in that spiritual quest, I started looking for ways to uh, adorn myself with different symbols, you know, for intentional use, for spiritual use, different things like that. And so um, I started reading about different types of adornment, uh, tattooing, piercing, uh, branding, different things like that. And mm -hmm. so I read about henna and I thought, well, this is really interesting. So I went and I bought a small kit somewhere, maybe craft store someplace, and I, I mixed it up and I put it on and I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And so I started doing more of it and little by little I started reading more and more. This is way before, you know, the interwebs and everything else. And so, uh, you know, I had to do a lot of digging through like uh, bookstores and uh, looking through things the old-fashioned way, <gasps> like encyclopedias, <laughs> heaven forbid. <laughs> um, but I did find a lot of information, and little by little, I started reading about it, the chemistry of it, how it worked, the different designs, the different cultures it comes from. And little by little, I just started compiling it all and, compract and practicing on people, and then started doing fairs, and here I am, 17 years later. It was something that uh, I fell in love with, and I'm still in love with today. That's great. It does yeah. change. I mean, does, every yeah. person is going to be a little bit different, so the design's going to change. You mm -hmm. know, my hand or my arm is not going to be the same as the next, literally the next person. Mm -hmm. um, so that is so neat that yeah. you've been doing it for so long and enjoying it for so long. Oh, yeah, and then there's so, there's so much to learn about it in, in terms of the cultures that it comes from. Uh, it's, it's very cosmopolitan in terms of how far it, its reach was and still is all across the globe. I mean, this is far... Uh, it's gone as far east as uh, Southeast Asia mm -hmm. uh, to the Philippines, and it's gone as far west as Moorish Spain, and even up into England wow. a little bit. So that whole area, you know, it, it definitely uh, was definitely exchanged, you know, through the Silk Route, you know, for trade and everything. And so it's gone through like North Africa, primarily known in the Middle East, mm -hmm. North Africa, India, and Arabic cultures. That's where it's still practiced primarily today. Um, people still do henna in various areas all over the world, but those are the areas that in which it started. Um, henna is a plant and it grows in a, a very tall sort of shrub. And what they do is they take the leaves and they dry the leaves and they grind it into a small, into a powder, into a very fine powder, which I actually have some here. And you can take a look at it and see it. And it's a very, very fine powder. It's almost like a talcum powder, but it smells wonderful. If you want to smell it, you're welcome yeah, to. Yeah, should I do that earlier? It's, yeah. I thought it was going to be really strong, almost like a spice, and it's yeah. not. It smells it's... almost like hay. It smells like a nice summer yeah. day. Yeah. I was thinking alfalfa. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah exactly. And so, Sorry, guys, no smell of vision. That's yeah, okay. yeah no, no smell of vision. You'll have to come and get Hannah from me to get the smell of vision effect. But there you go. There you go. Yes, and it's very fine because yeah, you have to. Yeah, you can see it. It, it like puffs. Yeah, so you have to put it through. When I, when I apply it, you have to put it through a very small bottle. But the idea is that Hannah only grows in, Arab, in, in dry areas. So it only would grow in places like India, sub Saharan areas, places that it would uh, be able to grow. You couldn't grow it here in New England because it's too cool, it's too moist. So 
but and the weather changes every 10 minutes and the weather changes every 10 minutes <laughs> but if we lived in arizona you could technically you could probably set. grow it there yes yeah I would of farms so. yeah <laughs> um, yeah, well, and I do want to say, because Maria is going to be at the Web of Light Expo. Yay. Uh, April 21st, 22nd at uh, Earth Day weekend at the Courtyard Marriott. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you know, you definitely should stop by and take a snort because we don't have <laughs> smell vision um, Well, you get a yeah. snort. <laughs> well, that's that's, that's going to be a exactly. really <laughs> interesting. I'm going to get henna from me. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's going to be a very interesting <laughs> look. So, um, but, um, so henna dates back how far? Uh, about 3000 BCE. So even before Christ. They have... Um, so 3000 BCE, that's, that's 5,000 years. 5,000 years, yeah. There are even uh, images that they found in various, uh, like, uh, areas, like in uh, the, the Fertile Crescent area, which is now known as, I think it's Iraq and Iran area, mm -hmm. um, where they've seen, like, red ochre designs on figurines, clay figurines. So, so clearly at that representing... Point, that idea, the idea of putting a pigment on the body for some sort of purpose, whether it's for intentional use or protection against evil or for good health or whatever purpose, that obviously seems like that was an intentional thing done, even as far back at that point. So, and that's primarily what it was used for way back then, because, you know, when they didn't have modern medicine, they, they, they put their forth their, their, their prayers, their intentions, you know, whether it be through dance or through music or for marking on the body or marking on a stone, whatever it was, whatever you it was all done for intention, yeah. yeah, whatever that purpose was. Now you, uh, now you d started with medicinal herbs and aromatherapies mm -hmm. and things like that. Right. Uh, and what was, what was, what was the moment, what were you doing artistically before you got involved with the henna tattooing? Which are which is temporary tattooing. I mean, one yeah, of the I it just put it, right. it lasts for how long? Roughly two weeks. Two weeks. Right. The idea that uh, the thing is that it's, we call it a tattoo, but it's not really a tattoo in that it's not invasive to the skin. There's right. no needles involved. If you want to look at it a different way, it's almost like frosting a cake, Ooh. and you take a small little thing, or like puffy paint when you're decorating like a T-shirt. You use a small bottle or a small cone, and you're squeezing it on. You're laying the design, the paste onto the skin. So you're not piercing the skin. So there's no invasion of the skin. It doesn't hurt. It's a painless uh, activity. But uh, in relation to your question, um, I had that knowledge and respect and reverence for the natural world even when I was going to school and when I was studying about biology. I have sort of a very interesting uh, duality in that I know all about the scientific aspects of that. And, the and then you world. moved into the... And then I flipped over and I became involved in the more spiritual aspect and involving you know, I, I, I looked into Native American shamanism for a while and studied some of that, and then I discovered Wicca, and uh, I, that sort of was my salvation, you know, finding, finding a, an archetypal uh, goddess form and uh, finding out that that was something that was always revered, you know, in ancient cultures, and that gave me a lot of confidence, and it gave me a lot of... Uh, self-love for myself, which I never had before. Mm. So with that in mind, I saw the plant and I saw its work as something that was done for women by other women. And so I wanted to share that. And so that's one of the things that I find that henna does is it's incredibly giving in terms of the gifts that it brings to people. They say in Morocco that henna has what they call good baraka, which means it has good energy. Mm. It has good, it, whenever you're putting henna on somebody, you're giving them a blessing, whatever it is. So I feel like every time I'm doing that on somebody, I'm giving them a blessing, whatever it's for. And I see the transformations when I do wow. henna on people. Uh, they come into my booth or they come into my table and they're, they're frazzled or they're harried or they've had a bad day and I they sit and we talk and they have henna done and they just walk away and they just, you can see the difference, you can feel the difference wow. and they walk away and it's like you've changed them. It's a gift. Every time I do it, it's a gift. Well, and she is going to be giving this gift <coughs> to, uh, she's going to be doing a, a henna tattoo on my upper arm and mm -hmm. she's going to do one on And hopefully we'll have time for you. Yep. Um, do you want to start? So that people can yeah. actually you can see what this looks like. Sure. Um, we do have a couple of pictures. I'm going to have you explain yes. the pictures first. If we can bring the first picture up. Now, this viewers. is a very yep. intricate design here. Mm -hmm. What is this? So that is a drum that I uh, did for a friend of mine. 
And henna can be put on different sorts of uh, substrates. People use henna for decorating. Like if you go to Moroccan import stores, quite often they'll do lamps that are made with natural hide uh, for the shades, and they'll decorate them with henna. And they'll glaze oh. them over, and they'll, they'll have this sort of creation. So um, what this is, this is a drum, a rawhide drum, that a friend of mine wanted me to decorate for her. So that is a traditional Moroccan design that I did. Um, you can see the design is very geometric. Uh, in a lot of Islamic art, they do not allow uh, images to be drawn as they actually appear in real life. It's against the, the tenet of Islam to do that. So anything that's drawn is done in geometric form and 90 degree angles and things like that. So you can see a lot of the things that are in there are very geometric, very mm -hmm. right angle. So that is a traditional uh, Moroccan design done on a natural head drum. I like it. Okay. Also makes a good cake. Now, do you mm -hmm. drum? Um, I can drum a little bit. I'm actually the daughter of a very well-known drummer from New England. So my father was a jazz drummer oh. at Mercury, and uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. But um, I grew up with drumming, so uh, I do love drumming even to this day, but I don't do it primarily. Well, I have to tell you, my husband and I, we do, uh, uh, we do a, a regular drumming circle. We were doing a full oh. moon mm -hmm. monthly yes. that was open, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, but we... I, I think I'm shifting it to quarterly because our lives are so busy. He's going back to school, and we got a lot of stuff going on. So a lot of moons. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, we'll have to invite you next time if you want to come. I would love it's to. It's a very uh, laid back. Just you know, we don't do big formal. We do meditation and. Mm -hmm. Kind of stuff, so that's great. Can we well, get, I have to get my, my hand if you like? Oh, yes. Well, I'd like to show, yeah, I'd like you to g give the camera a hand. I don't know if they can see it. On now, when did you do that? On your so, hands? this design that I did on my hand, I did this one on what's today, Monday. So, I did this Saturday night. So, um, the whole process with doing henna is I make a paste with the powder and I mix in lemon juice and essential oils. And so, what the essential oils do is they have. Uh, uh, chemicals in them called terpenes and terpenes are natural solvents they're similar to what you would use uh, for something like a paint thinner or uh, even like a gasoline turpentine mm, benzene related. things like that but those are all chemical based of course the the, the terpenes that are in the essential oils are uh, natural so what they do is they extract what's called uh, lawson which is the active pigment in the henna and it allows it to be de to be deposited and stain the skin so when I first put the paste on, I create the design, I paint it on, I leave it on. This, is, this one was on overnight. And then when you first take it off, it's about, it's sort of an orangey color, and then it oxidizes. This is actually a result of an oxidation reaction on the skin. And so this stain is about 24 hours old. And That's it's going to continue cool. to get darker. It's going to get a little bit darker. It's probably peaking right about now. But, um, and the best places to stain are uh, hands and feet. That's where you get the best color because the skin is thinnest. Mm. And it's also warm and moist. And henna needs warmth and moisture to oxidize and get fully, fully dark. Which is ironic since it comes from a place that's hot and dry. Exactly. <laughs> but the interesting thing about henna is that um, you know, it's not only done just also for decoration purposes or uh, you know, for ceremonies like for weddings or things like that, but it's also uh, very medicinal. So henna is antimicrobial, antifungal, and antiviral. So by having the henna on the skin, it's a protective thing that you can put on the skin. That's neat. You think I'll about never it, have guessed. you can do it. And actually, um, I, I belly dance, and so a lot of my friends always want to get henna on their fingertips because they're zilling. They're playing the finger Those zills. Little symbols. And by putting henna on your skin, it actually toughens your fingertips because the, the law zone tightens, it binds with the keratin in your skin, and it tightens it and it strengthens it. So it makes the skin stronger, so you're not able... You oh, good, then get, I need henna by the corners so of my you don't eyes. Get, <laughs> <laughs> so you get a little bit there. No. <laughs> so, so it's just like, a little it's right like tightening there. the skin on you. your hands, so it, tight, it protects your skin. So you think about it, where the henna is actually traditionally done, hands and feet, a lot of the areas that people there, like say, for example, in uh, Morocco, they're covered hand to t you know, head to toe, except for the hands and feet. Right. They put henna on it, and it actually protects the skin from the elements. And they live in quite harsh climates. As I say, heat, so, sun, dust, yeah, yep, exactly. Good, well, good place to be. Oh yeah. No, I think that we could, <laughs> we could henna her around her eyes. A little of this. Just give her, you know, to give mask. her an exotic look. Well, put a little mask on I'm her. I'm not doing any Mike Tyson's today. <laughs> yes. There you go. Henna does not actually work on the face. That's interesting. No, no, it does not. There are some areas that it takes much better. Hands and feet are the best. Um, you can do other places like shoulders, back. Navel, those areas do stain, but not as dark as hands and feet. The and they face don't do the work. face. No, it does not work in the face. Well, there you go. No. Okay. That's what we have all the makeup for. We can decorate yes. our, <laughs> we'll, we can decorate we'll decorate our faces in other ways. There you oh. go. <laughs> She's going to do something on you. I am. Yes. So I am. we're going we're gonna to have her 
uh, I didn't properly prepare because uh, you said now, how long is it going to be? Uh, how long does it need to not be disturbed? Well, three hours optimally. I mean, I, you can leave it on longer. You can leave in, even leave it on until tonight if you want to or tomorrow morning, uh, but minimum three hours because it has to allow for enough of the time for the uh, henna to stain your skin so you get a good color. Okay. Yeah. So we're now going to watch as she's going to do a... And now you, now you, you an advanced thank showed, you to our camera folks, by the way, because this is going to be a little bit tricky. So <laughs> the other thing I want to point out is that she actually had a book with designs that she showed yep. Rona. She's going to be doing um, one on Rona with a design. Yeah. Um, but I've asked her to tap into her spiritual, intuitive, creative self and to just give me whatever energy or whatever I need um, on here. And we have chosen the shoulder because I was going to do my inner arm, but I didn't bring a razor blade. I'm a little too hairy. It's, it's okay. Hairy. No worries. <laughs> Maria, we'll make it work. We'll make it happen. Absolutely. We can. So, and if starting with a little squeeze bottle. I have to get a little cozy. To excuse Ooh. me. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's not a first round here. I'll put your arm right about here. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And then, uh, as much as you can, explain look at what you're that. Doing. Look at Tiny the on. point is. She's just drawing. It's so fluid. It's like Zentangle on you. Yep. Does it feel like it tickles or does it, is it soft? No. I mean, I'm trying to stay as still as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't want to m mess up what she's doing. Um, but there's just a very... Yeah, it's a little, it's, uh, it's almost like a little ticklish, mm -hmm. like just a little light thing. And of course, the, the henna is a little um, cool, cooler. That's right, because it's, it's a wet product. It's going to go on wet. and mm -hmm. It's going to go on wet, and it's going to go from there. I'm amazed. I mean, the sheer amount of time it takes is, it's fascinating to me that, you know, it takes three hours for it to sit. Marie and I were discussing um, before the show started, I had seen something on using henna to dye your hair. You have to keep it on for five to six hours. Mm -hmm. Lucille Ball actually used to use it on her hair. Apparently it works. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she, she was, was quite the most the famous redhead, redhead around, She's so quite a redhead. She used to use awesome. henna on her hair, yeah. Yep. I have a couple of her quotes in, my, in that uh, Silver Screen Siren journal. Yeah. She's an amazing woman. But yeah, the... Um, it, it, it's a long process. This is not a, hey, quick rub up, you know, like temporary tattoos, you know, right. just put a little alcohol, whip it off, you know, take it off and you're good to go. This is, this is meditative for both of you. I mean, you had said, you know, you feel people kind of calm down and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, for most of us, the, the need to stop and not move for X amount of time is rare. It's very hard for people to do that nowadays. And I yeah. think people need to do that more. Oh, because I Because we're yeah. all crazy busy running around checking our phones and Hannah gives you a chance to take a mental break that you need to do because mm -hmm. let's face it, you know, we, we can't we can't run forever, you know, we have to take time of our take time and take care of ourselves. And all of us who have tried, you know, who have run for too long, we we, we pay the price. Mm -hmm. Well in ancient cultures They weren't running around so much. <laughs> They were on different time than we are. <laughs> yes. And in a heated climate, too, you're not going to be moving as fast. And Yeah. Well, if you got up in the morning, got everything done before the sun was high, mm -hmm. and then um, were to put henna in your hair or were to do a design, then you go and you just lay quietly in the noonday sun and into the yeah. afternoon. You know, the whole idea of the siesta. Yep. Yeah, it's perfect for that. Yeah. Primarily, when henna was done, it was done for women when they were going to be uh, getting married. So usually it was done at night. They would do like a night of henna. And so, you know, they would wash the bride's hair and bathe her and clean her. And then they would start to do things like putting the henna on, perfuming her, you know, even dyeing the, the, the uh, skin with uh, turmeric to give it sort of a golden glow. <sighs> so all these things have now been done. Now that's a bachelorette for, party. Oh, yes. That's, well, it's the equivalent of, it a, is. of a bachelorette party. Nowadays, people do bridal showers and bachelorette parties. This is their version this of it. This was their version, Exactly. Yeah. A time for the women to be with the women. Exactly. And it was not something that the men could participate in. Men don't usually get henna. 
uh, in traditional cultures. They sometimes do a little bit, maybe on the side of the hand, mm -hmm. uh, especially in India, but primarily it's a women's thing. Nowadays, of course, men get yeah, not as much as women do. I could see men doing it for some of the protection symbols, or as mm -hmm. you said, it seems to strengthen the hands, and as a oh, hunter yeah. and things like that. Now, was was henna in Egypt? Henna was probably in Egypt, yeah, I think it was. I, I do remember looking at a map and seeing that it was in the Egypt area. So, uh, seems also to be the, the right temperature. Area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it was definitely, you, definitely there. we have evidence that, that the men did did some version of makeup or jewelry in the Egyptian if they were of a high caste. Yeah. Think. Yes, I think they did coal and they did swak, which was a type of uh, uh, gum that they would uh, chew uh, to brighten their teeth. Mm. And they would also use, uh, uh, do different types of markings on the skin, especially like in Morocco, Berber culture, they did the harkous, which are the tribal markings, which were delineated oh, yeah. uh, tribal, uh, tribal, uh, tribal lineation, basically. So that would be important. I can tell some of the essential oils you have in that. I can smell them because mm -hmm. I work with essential oils. Right. Mm -hmm. That's actually kind of a neat combination. You can, you know, that the, that the oils and the scents is also going to contribute to the experience. The experience, the relaxing, the, the breathing a little deeper. I think that's one of the great things. As somebody who breathes, I know, very shallowly, um, you know, to intentionally breathe slower, breathe deeper. The other thing that's interesting, too, is the oils that I use. Uh, I use Kajaput primarily, but some people use other ones. They use tea tree or they use uh, Ravansara or they might use eucalyptus. But um, the, for example, putting them on, putting the henna on your hands or on your feet, mm -hmm. especially in the summertime, it's very cooling. It's very refreshing because henna oh. pulls heat out of your body oh, and it feels very, neat. very nice on a hot day. I love the smell of tea tree and eucalyptus. I know a lot oh, of people yeah. don't. It's very strong, but I happen to like it. No, yeah. it's actually, this paste actually smells very nice. If you want to smell it, you're welcome to. Ooh. This is the finished paste. I know it looks kind of unsavory. <laughs> no, it actually looks paste. like chocolate. It looks good to me. You don't want to put it on your toast, though. <laughs> right, no toast. No toast. But it smells Ooh. nice. Yeah, wow. That is like, my, my the, the sinuses went, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you said there's kajaput in there? Kajaput, yeah. That's mm. what I'm smelling. Yep, that's, that's what one I use. That one I don't know. What is kajaput? It's great for teeth if you're having teeth issues. Oh, yeah. I use kajaput on my Ooh, gums. Oh, I like teeth. it. Mm -hmm. it, also, it also, that's because, a fresh smell. Yes, and because it's a strong smell, for me, it makes me breathe, it automatically makes me breathe it deeper. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Just take it further into your... Kajaput has a very earthy smell to me. I like it. There's a, there's a... When I smell kajaput, I think of being uh, out in a field in like late spring, early summer, where there's still a lot of dampness and before the yeah. heat is coming. Damp is, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And that's interesting, that's again. That, the, that scent is called pelicor, that earthy mm -hmm. smell, that sort of wet leaves smell. That's what that they call it. Pelicor, I think like is the name of it, yeah. Again, that's interesting, you know, the whole idea of the, the earthiness of it, the connection to the fact that it's, that henna is something that grows. This is not a chemical, mm -hmm. this is not, and again, you know, in a hot and dry place. Now we're talking about a place that would be, you know, a forest. Now you're thinking cool and wet. So you're, you're bringing in sort of these two different um, elements in some ways. Exactly. And letting them blend. Exactly. And the interesting thing is that I make my own henna paste. I do not use pre-made cones. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of pre-made cones that are out in the market. Um, that you can easily buy on Amazon or import stores, and they are full of chemicals because henna is a perishable product. And once it's made, oh. it only lasts for maybe three or four days. So you wouldn't want to, you know, you right. certainly don't want to put something on your skin, which is your the largest organ in your body, something that is old or uh, perishing or perishable or <laughs> something that is full of chemicals, which those cones are. Right. Um, quite often they will put things in there to make them accelerate the color and to make it darker to make it last longer mm -hmm. and they are toxic over time. Yeah. Um, that's something that is, that is done quite frequently. Another thing that they also do is they put in something called PPD and PPD is a coal tar dye. And so the problem is that when they put that, it's not something that's normally present in hair dye, mm -hmm. um, but in, in hair dye, it's at much lower concentrations. When they put it into these pre-made cones, it has concentrations of 4% all the way up to 23%. That's a big difference. And so the problem is that when you put these PPD 
the ingredient onto the skin, it can cause very, very bad scarring. And they do it primarily in areas like in uh, Mexico, where they do a lot of resort henna. Mm -hmm. And it can end up with having very, very bad scarring on the skin. Yeah, and it would make the skin burns. sensitive too. Yeah. Well, these are these are it, what happens is it gets into the system and it has a very bad scar. Uh, I can show a picture if people want to see that. Don't show the picture of the scars. I can show it actually. <laughs> Excuse me, as I fall out of the range here. Um, but they do it a lot in areas. For example, like for example, this is a black henna. Right here. This is a black henna. Design oh, yeah. that was done in in Mexico. Mm -hmm. You can see with the black henna. This is with this with the paste off, and then you can see the scarring afterwards. Holy cow! That's, that's what happens to the skin. Yikes! Let that's. Oh my! That's so this scar. is a reaction to the PPD, and this is something. This would be a scar that this person will have probably for at least a year. Um, so you have to be very careful about people that are doing henna, especially in other countries, because the thing is, too, is that here in America, henna is not regulated by the FDA. No, it's natural. It's because it's natural, it's considered an herb. So the thing is that there are many people out there that are doing all kinds of henna, and they're using all kinds of pre-made cones, pre-made things full of chemicals, and they're toxic, and you do not want to get that on your skin. So, so always, when traveling? When traveling, or if you want to get henna, you should ask the henna person do they make their own paste? What are the ingredients? Um, is it, you know, sometimes they keep it, if it's a hot day, they keep it on ice because it's, like I said, it's perishable and it should not be uh, kept warm because it uh, loses color very quickly. So these are things you have to ask your henna artist because you want to be sure that you have something that's safe and natural on your skin. Well, there you go. You that's a, that would be our PSA skin. for the day. And the thing is that it's very, henna is very easily bought on places like Amazon. So unfortunately, it's all too easy for unsavory, unethical henna artists to be putting this on henna, on people in resort areas, beach towns, things like that. Oh, and yeah. unfortunately, uh, people can get reactions. And the thing is, it's not just black henna, but they are also putting other kinds of, of colors out there that are not safe. Uh, for example, there are cones out there that they are using um, industrial strength uh, food dyes in henna cones to make them these crazy colors like purple or pink or mm. any of these other colors. And those are just as bad. They're not as reactive as the PPD ones. But they're, but they're not meant to be. They're not meant to be used on the skin. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're taking shortcuts and they're messing with people's health all the all the So I hope our viewers public. can see, because this color is, is you know, I, I had referred to it as chocolate, but it is. It's kind of a chocolatey brown. Sort of it's a chocolatey not brown. black. Yep, it's not black. Now, when, the, when this first comes off, it's going to be sort of an orange color and then it'll change to a reddish brown like you saw on my hand. Yeah. We're almost done. You've done a great job holding steel, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I can go into a meditative space. Mm -hmm. I'm into my zen. He's in a zen zone. Now, when people use henna in their hair, it's to make it red. Mm -hmm. So, but this, you said this is more of a brown and an orange. Mm -hmm. So it reacts differently to the... Hair. Well, when you put it in your hair, you prepare it a little bit differently. You don't put essential oils in it. You just put it with uh, hot water, you put it on your hair, and then uh, you put like a shower cap yeah, on it, and you leave it on it. overnight, and then you wash it off in the morning. And you're a redhead. And, and you're a and your bathtub as long as you want. <laughs> it, no, lasts, I mean, it doesn't wash. How long would it take? It doesn't wash off. No, no it, you it, have to wait for it to grow out. Takes yeah, it, it lasts an incredibly long time because it oh, gets yeah. in, after that many hours, it gets starts to get into the core. Oh yeah, and it's very very red, very very orange. You are done, my, my friend. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Oh, I love it. So You're now, can yang. I ask why you chose yin and yang? Little birdie told me. <laughs> oh, okay. So somebody did tell you. Just a little bit. Okay. But that's okay. No, I that's fine. I wanted that. I want to do something on you that I knew that you would like. Yes, absolutely, and that's and that's that's great. But the mandala design was something I just kind of thought of too. So this is this is my wedding ring. Oh wow! And I designed this with the jeweler so that we would have matching yin, yin, yin and yang. And when we were engaged, he had one half and I had the other. Oh. And then we sent them back to the jeweler about six weeks before the wedding yep. to get a sealed yin and yang. So he, so I saw you doing the yin and yang. I'm like, now is she hitting it intuitively? Did she see my ring or did somebody tell her? A little bit of everything. <laughs> I admit, because we had talked to her, she said, what shapes do, you know? And I said, well, there's everything from, you know, the Celtic, you know, the beautiful Celtic knots, which also would look lovely in mm -hmm. henna and, and things like that, because we certainly have some of that in our in our mugs. And then I did, I, I because I sitting next to you and I see the, 
your your gesture and stuff. And so I did mention the yin and yang, but I like the way she incorporated it. It's so different. Uh, yeah, it is. And I it, with the so mandala. Now I don't. I just leave this mm -hmm. as is, so I can't right. put my sleeve down. You should not put your sleeve down, no, because it has to take time to dry. You have to leave this on a minimum of three hours. It'll take maybe 10, 15 minutes to dry, and then you leave it on for the three hours, and then you brush it off. It's almost going to be like a mud. It'll kind of crumble off. It'll be the orange color underneath, and then you want to moisturize it with a natural oil like olive oil or coconut oil, and it will change to the brown color. Like on my skin, you can see the browner color. Mm -hmm. On this area, it may be a little bit more of a brown. On my skin, you can see it's almost like a black cherry. Henna ranges in colors from like a terracotta to sort of a brown color, almost a coffee color. Everyone's skin is different because everyone has different chemistries. Yeah. So your color may be different from my color. Okay. But it's always in that range of browns. So now, you said in... in um, 15 minutes or so it will be dry mm -hmm. but I still am not going to want to put a shirt on or correct because I want to leave it on for correct. as much time as possible correct and you want to kind of leave it quiet you don't want to go play volleyball or anything like that you want that's it of, volleyball's out for next volleyball time. is definitely out for the rest of the afternoon but you want to definitely <laughs> let, so little, let it sit there let it be quiet enjoy relax do your thing and then you take the paste off and you moisturize it and you can watch it change watch the color change it's really quite and uh, magical to watch the change Great. Well, I can't wait to get home. Thank Jeff's going to love this. All you right. did a great is. job as it's far as I can tell. Beautiful. Because I'm looking at it in an odd angle. Yeah, right. I was about to say. It, I'm like, That's ah. why I've always thought if I had a tattoo, I would never put it somewhere I couldn't see it. Right. I mean, if I'm going to go through all of that, I want to be able to see the dark thing. Exactly. <laughs> so now I'm going to have you go ahead and start on. Do you have time enough to do the mermaid? I sure on do. Okay. All right. Absolutely. So I'm going to have you do the mermaid. Okay. Um, we're going to, you and I are going to. Are switch. You gonna reach okay, so you're going to move over here. I'm going to turn cord around. Cord. Which hand are we going to do for you? We'll use the, the one closest to you. We'll okay, so easier. the challenge is that I don't know if they're going to be able to see it while it, because typically I have it on um, mm -hmm. on my lap when we're working. So. Now, this is a much different design. And do you want to hand That's me. That's okay. They may not be able to see you work it, but we'll show that to them at the end. Okay, so can you, we'll make um, it work. Show me uh, your design book. So There's some very fun designs in there. Oh, okay. and she's going to peek. So, well, for those of you who this have is my cheat sheet. <laughs> for those of you who have, you know, been with us for a while, you all know that I had last year I had three books with mermaids come out, and so she's going to give me a little mermaid. Yeah, just relax your elbow a little bit. Okay. You're very tense elbows. So, these elbows. <laughs> so now, as you, so you're going to actually be doing it by the with the book right beside it. Yes, because that gives me like a visual cue in terms of how I how I do it. I have books. I have lots and lots of books at home and the, I have thousands of designs so I can't remember them all so this mm. just sort of gives me a cue on how to, how to do it. I'm almost the same size as her picture hand. Yeah, too. just about. Now, um... Oh, I do. I love the scent. Yeah, it's a great scent. Um, so, m one of my questions is, and I'm going to move your coffee over there just in case. Oh, all right. Uh, oh, now I can see yours better. Yeah. So, now, are these designs that you got from somewhere, or did you create all of these yourself? Well, a lot of these designs actually come from other artists. Uh, we buy what's called an ebook, and an ebook is basically a downloadable PDF version of designs that other, other artists have drawn. Oh, so that's so how you get the rights. That's how we get the rights to be able to use it. So we can use it to duplicate it for our own use for here, but we can't say that this is our design because these are all copyrighted images. So. That's why. Uh, then, so basically, it's the same idea as like when uh, tattoo artists buy flash. It's the same idea. I need to change this too. Um, <laughs> so it's the same idea. They buy art that other artists have designed, and so henna artists have done the same thing. So we have the eBooks. So it's a little different. Same idea, but a little bit different modality. So. That's nice because then everybody can kind of contribute too. Exactly, and then people can do all different kinds of designs or whatever they whatever they, um, they they're most passionate about, whatever it is. Whether they want to do something that's traditionally Moroccan or something that's traditionally Indian, or bridal patterns or whatever it is. So, you know, everybody's got their thing. Right now, the big thing that's very hot in the henna world is designs that look almost more like jewelry. There's a lot of drapes and swing oh. uh, sort of like swags with like charms and I things like that. I would never guess there were trends. Oh yes, there's the definitely trends. Oh yeah, oh yeah, every year there's a new design. Somebody designs 
uh, design of some kind and it ends up on Instagram and oh, everybody yeah. like, like last year there was a big huge sleeve that everybody wanted and that came oh my gosh that's yeah gotta... everybody wanted that that's that's definitely a private appointment kind of thing yeah <laughs> um, that's but, a, and a time commitment for everybody and a time commitment I would not normally do that when I was set up at a, at a festival or a fair that those are definitely take a very very long time to do so She's doing the scales on the back of my hand. Oh, good, we can see it now. That's yeah. great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So um, now have you contributed it for your, any designs yet, any of your designs? Um, actually, I was scheduled to do a book this year, and I just wasn't feeling it. And I just needed to step back and kind of re-up my game in terms of feeling more confident about my technique. So this year, I am not doing a book, but I was um, hoping to do one for next year. Ooh. Um, there is a publisher that I know of that uh, works locally that uh, publishes a lot of books from people all over. And uh, uh, so she and I are good friends, and so we work together. Sometimes we do events together. And so she and I are going to work on putting one together, maybe for next year. So hopefully that will happen. I hope it does. So we'll see. Yeah, well, um, uh, you should hook your your friend that's the publisher up with us. We should get her on the show. We oh, get yeah. a lot of our, uh, you know, we get a lot of authors and we get a lot of people that are at different stages. Oh yeah, for sure. So we like to talk about different, you know, the different things. At some point, I've been, I, I want to uh, actually do some a couple of business shows geared towards artists about the business oh, yeah. of oh, art. The people who are helping get the art out. Because. Like you a know, publisher. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, well, and it's so funny because you have your, you have your practical artist, mm -hmm. and your practical artists are your makeup artists, right. your hairdressers, your tattoo, your henna tattoo, your practical mm -hmm. artist that create something that they go, this, this is... Manicurists. Manicurists. Th this is, and, and even sometimes your jewelry person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you have your artists who are all, maybe they make jewelry, maybe they make all of this stuff, but, the, but there's, you know, a dozen of them might fit in an egg box, but you couldn't crack them open and get two ounces of business wisdom. Mm. Exactly. So they do beautiful art or are a beautiful singer or painter right, or but whatever. Um, but the world may never discover them because they don't know how to put themselves out or what to yeah, do. Yeah, which is, you know, it's a challenge to, to you know, we all have our strengths. And um, unfortunately, there are, the combination of business and creativity does not always um, seem to mesh. And I think there are, there are lies told about it that you can't be good at creativity and good at business, which is crazy because there's so much creativity potential I, in business. I, I think you can do both. I agree. I think there's room for both, definitely. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's funny because I want to say you, you can do both. Sometimes you almost have to schedule when you're going to be on which do. side of your brain. You, yeah, you definitely do. You know, there is a, I, as somebody who's a high creative and a high business person, I find like if I'm in the middle of working on a story and I get a call and somebody wants a mm. business something from me even if it's they want business consulting from me then i'm like okay wait a second i gotta reset for a second <laughs> <laughs> wait what am i who am i what am i doing yeah, yeah. there's no, a lot of multitasking <laughs> there there is it's a lot of multitasking and you do just sometimes have to stop and say okay you know from this time to this time i yep. will be doing and yep. and if you know your most creative times i'm most creative in the mornings so somewhere around you know okay, after you lunch done. you know i'm best at Okay, so look at that. How quickly that was done is what was what was amazing with all of that detail. Isn't now, that beautiful. You you have a, an event you said in a couple of weeks. Or yeah, something? a little a less than two weeks. Uh -huh. I'm actually speaking at um, a writing conference for writers and readers in oh, New Jersey. Wonderful. And in case you, all of my viewers know, I gesticulate a lot with the hands, so she's going to go with me to New Jersey. Which is perfect because she'll give you some you have, good juju. She will give me yes, yeah, some, some beautiful good yes. Good baraka. Some good Absolutely, baraka. and people will enjoy you know the the connection between my books and my and my henna art. You're wearing your art. I am. Yeah, literally You're wearing your art. <laughs> so, do you still do? Um, things with herbs and aromatherapies and all that, or has henna kind of taken your life? Well, I still 
use a lot of that in my normal everyday life because I try to use as much natural products around my home, on my body. Um, I don't go to the extent of making my own soap or anything like that, <laughs> but I still yeah. uh, am very conscious of that on a very uh, on many different levels, not only environmentally, but also just for keeping my house uh, sort of my sanctuary, keeping it uh, clean and keeping it nice and wonderfully scented mm. and uh, using that uh, everything that I that I have in my life is something that is meaningful and that's even including the herbs so even uh, taking more natural healing remedies instead of going and taking uh, taking something for a cold chances are I'll take the echinacea before yeah. I go and take something like a Tylenol cold formula you know? yeah so which is better I try to keep everything as natural as possible in my life so and that's one of the things that's wonderful about henna is that it's uh, uh, it's something that's brought a lot of good things to my life and so that's something that it, 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 it sort of encompasses my entire my entire everything so well we're, we're the show is over oh, we're it's wrapping over. Uh, it it oh, happens so quickly happens it always so does so fast we want to thank uh maria uh she is going to be at the web of light expo mm -hmm. um plus you have underneath her and at the end of the show how to contact her uh but she'll be at the web of light expo april 21st 22nd uh earth day weekend and you can go up and you can sniff her henna and look at her <laughs> um, look at her art and mm -hmm. look at her all the different things uh, so we invite you to stop by and say hello and mm -hmm. tell her you saw her on the on dragons <laughs> unicorns and other creative creatures uh, so art comes in all forms your body is an art form it can be a canvas it can be a mannequin that you're stringing jewelry and clothes on it is still an art form maybe it's time you upped your art game Namaste.